that there were some aspects of AI that would be helpful in the general sense the academy came to you via the libraries a year ago. Thank you, Nicole. So um, this is the third and final discovery session for the Information Intelligent Machines and New Knowledge series of this year. We will continue this in the coming years. And uh, we'll be kicking off a series of dialogues next month in 5 February, which after historian and Osama Khatib, computer scientist, in conversation with Nicole right here, uh, our digital research architect on the topic of androids, automata, avatars, and agency. Not the central intelligence agency. <laughs> Please do save the date or visit the library, uh, visit the library site, library.sandra.ed for more information. In addition to the 50 or so individuals joining us here in this room, in the East Asia Library, I'd like to extend a warm welcome to those of you joining us via Zoom. Nicole Coleman is monitoring this in the chat. So if you have a question or comment, please use the chat feature and we'll address your questions and or raise them during the Q&A. Today, you will be shown a few pilot projects our staff has engaged in in this past year in our AI studio. About 30 staff from various departments across the Stanford libraries uh, participated in the studio, and a handful of staff will present lightning talks today, including the following. One, metadata librarians with Hillary Thorson and Arcadia Falcone. Two, archivists from special collections and the Lucy Archives, Sally DeBosch and Josh Schneider. Three, an academic technology specialist, Claudia Engel, working in collaboration with graduate students. Uh, who is just being, is obvious at you? You saw me? Yes. Excellent. And I turn Rebecca Wingfield, research developers from CIDR, Scott Bailey and Javier de Rosa, and engineers from our digital library team, Sarah Shah, Jesse Keck, Jack Reed, and Chris Deer. Our AI studio is not a physical space, but a forum for staff to learn together and to begin to define useful, practical applications of AI within the libraries so that we can use this exciting new set of techniques to serve research. We are excited by the dedication and willingness of our staff to develop new skills, explore technology, new technologies, and engage with them critically, and then it's not incidentally take some risks. Because we have a full agenda, I'm going to pass it over to Hillary and Arcadia to kick off the lightning talks. Um, however, before I, I introduce our guest speaker today, let me provide a bit of background on how we got to where we are today. About a year ago, Stanford Libraries began exploring how we might incorporate new technologies associated with AI into our internal processes and how we might apply them to various researchers. We have incorporated already machine learning and natural language processing and computer vision into applications like EPAD, the software pack to build our special collections in the University Archives that supports the appraisal, ingest, processing, discovery, and delivery of email archives, and collaborative pro projects with faculty at the Library Center for Interdisciplinary Research. We took advantage of our proximity to Silicon Valley and the computer science department at Stanford to host informal conversations with experts in the field. In July of this year, we launched the AI Studio uh, as an opportunity for librarians to, to surface projects and get some hands-on experience with the new technology. I grew up the remarks here remind you all how you can tell a happy motorcyclist who look for the bugs in their teeth. <laughs> I think you. I think you would find happy uh, IT people uh, experimenting with new technologies and not worrying about the bugs in their team. So, I see a lot of happy guys, so I think this is happening. So, we've created this series, Information, Intelligent Machines, and Knowledge, to encourage a wider discussion with our colleagues across the country about the opportunities and implications of these technologies, and not just across the country. In uh, December, in Oslo, Norway, Collaboration with our friends in the National Library. Termine esto porque yo ahora camino un rato. Mandar piñas por aquí, que está bien. Somebody, somebody. En una hora. Cool. 
Ini mau macam nggak kira, anda pinat ya? Iya, translation. We had a uh, day long focus on AI and libraries. Uh, people It was a lively session, very well attended, um, um, absolutely terrific. So uh, these initial discovery sessions are focused on how this technology can better work here in the libraries. Um, and uh, we, as I said, in February, we took off the dialogue series. Uh, I think there's another one beyond that, isn't there? Oh, yes, on the 4th um, uh, March, Professor Peggy Fela and Manish Agrabala will address the human uh, machine interface. So without further ado, I think it's over to you, Hillary. No. No. Actually, we've had a change uh, in. So it's oh. gonna, we're going to start with um, Rebecca, Scott, Javier, and okay, uh, Arcadia. <laughs> Fast breaking news. <laughs> <laughs> Can I ask you to stop? Oh, sure. I'm Rebecca Winkle. I'm the creator of the British American Literature. Uh, I'm Scott Bailey, research developer and head of social science data and software with Insider. Oh, yeah, there's a research team looking at Okay, thank you for joining us this morning. We're going to talk to you about the experiment we did using topic modeling to describe 19th century novels. Um, so, Rebecca, can you start us off with a description? First, I just want to say a word about the Darndest collection itself. So the collection consists of over 1,600 single volume 19th century novels, all of which have been digitized. It features novels by writers who were popular in their day but are largely forgotten today. So we're talking about literary luminaries like Hugh Nisbet, Tristram Coots, Grant Allen, <laughs> Guy Boothby. Any fans out there? <laughs> yeah, I didn't think so because it's not the canonical authors that you study in the 19th century. No Jane Austen, no Charles Dickens, but it does contain a really rich array of genres, many of which are still with us today, so adventure fiction, crime stories, historical novels, romances, but other genres that flared up briefly, briefly and then are forgotten, so things like the new woman novel of the 18th. Um, and since this is a relatively obscure collection of novels, I just want to see, um, that subject access to it in search works is kind of not great. Um, if you try to explore the questions in search works, you're going to be really, really frustrated. There's not a lot of there in there in terms of capturing art. Um, topic, by geography, um, by genre. So what we did was we decided, um, oops, um, you know, to take as our question, how can topic modeling enhance subject access to this particular collection of novels? And we decided to do the topic modeling in a really unstructured way, so we weren't coming at it with predefined genre categories. We wanted to kind of see what topic modeling is. So Scott is going to take us through the topic modeling <coughs> process along with Javier. I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the results from the literary studies point of view, and Arcadia is going to explore possible uses of topic modeling for metadata. I'm going to talk just a little bit about how we actually process the corpus and then the machine learning techniques that we use. Uh, so the first thing, the corpus was delivered to us as zip files, full of zip files, full of XML files. <laughs> <laughs> Which is maybe as friendly as you would sort of hope if you're getting started with the analysis. So the very first thing that we had to actually do, we wrote a Python script uh, to process over the entire zip files, unzip them, unzip the files in there, uh, take the XML, parse it, and then rip out all of the actual text content. Uh, and just put those in the plain text file that would be a lot easier for us to actually process. Uh, at that point, since we didn't have labeled data, we decided to use uh, an unsupervised machine learning technique called topic modeling, uh, which, as David Fly, one of the people who sort of developed it, says helps you uncover hidden thematic structures. The hope would be that these hidden thematic structures might give us some sort of description of the types of content uh, or the types of themes that are within uh, the collection. So we ran this first without doing any pre-processing of the text, uh, any cleaning of it, in order to just sort of see what we got. And what we got back was mostly a lot of person and place names, um, because those both occur so much. So that gave us some ideas forward for how to actually clean the text. So again, in Python, it's the language that Javi and I working quite a bit. Uh, we then pre-processed the text uh, to remove person and place.
poisoning, to get more of that content. Uh, to remove numbers, single letter words, any characters that aren't alphabetical letters, uh, soft words, so commonly used words, uh, and then also the front and back matter. Most of these novels, when they were uh, OCR, include all the sort of advertisements uh, that were common to novels at that time period, and the front and back, we found that they were actually surfacing, uh, say, noise, or as noise in the models themselves, uh, since they weren't the actual content of the novel. So after that, we reran the topic models. Uh, at a number of different sort of topic levels, <coughs> where uh, what we sort of settled on was uh, getting about 60 thematic structures in uh, which we thought actually gave us some uh, content, some ideas about what was within uh, these structures. And at that point, since we're sort of doing this really as exploratory sort of experimental analysis, uh, we did quite a few different types of visualization. Um, visualizing both that what does a single novel look like when we break it down into sort of what themes or, or uh, topics occur within it, uh, what does the entire corpus look like, what does the topic distribution look like. I think we'll quickly show one of these, uh, which this is uh, an embedded model of the topics. You can see that all of these clusters within here are actually, uh, each one of these represents a single novel within the corpus of roughly 1,600 novels, uh, and they're color-coded by whatever the highest topic or the highest proportion topic in here. Uh, so this was a way for us to actually zoom in on some of the individual topics. Um, you can see this gives you the title, the source ID, and what's the most common topic. And we would then take that, reference it, uh, as a way for Rebecca uh, to actually explore um, I think Rebecca will come back to that a little bit more later. So, I do want to talk briefly about some issues that we ran into with the corpus processing. Uh, the first is simply that the way it was delivered is something which took quite a lot of work to actually unpack because of the size. Uh, even running on the data cruncher, which is a sort of a desktop that we have over in Green Library, with quite a lot of RAM, quite a lot of power to it, uh, it sometimes took over 12 hours just for us, just for us to unzip and pull the text out of the text. This is before we got into any analysis, before we did any pre-processing. Uh, so even on high power computers, this is a very time consuming process. Um, we also found that in the attempts to clean uh, the, some of the proper names, <coughs> the names out of the, the text, the models that we were using, since we were experimenting, we were using sort of off the shelf or models that are pre-trained. Uh, they were trained on 20th century, 21st century American English uh, on the internet, that doesn't necessarily help you with the novel uh, or with the language in this time period. It wasn't able to pick up a lot of the names, it wasn't able to pick up a lot of the, the places. So a lot of that came through the cleaning process. So if we were really trying to do this in a little bit more of a serious manner, we would really have to think about training our own model uh, as sort of uh, actually do this accurately, which means one has to label a lot of data uh, and go through that whole process. Uh, and we also found that despite us trying to sort of remove some of the back and front page matter, uh, we simply weren't able to do it based off of number of pages. We'd have to develop a real method uh, in order to cut down the amount of noise that we were getting coming through pretty clearly in topics, uh, which made it obviously a little less helpful. And this the last thing is that this, we ran the topic models in the clinic many, many, many times. So it took several days. Uh, we were running them sometimes they went for run. Uh, so that they process over mic. Uh, so this isn't the type of thing. Uh, so if you're on Zoom, if you would mind please muting your mic. <laughs> uh, so if we're thinking about this as a type of library process, uh, it's something we have to consider the best way to be able to talk. Uh, so we were So, uh, Scott mentioned on uh, the process for unpacking the data was so convoluted that as a byproduct of this experiment, we actually created a new browser application that allows you to download uh, the text data that is contained in PDFs containing a triple and manifest in the catalog of such uh, There was just an easy way to actually start the data with a uh, the, the unpacking of the ethanol file. <coughs> Also, we experimented with uh, with Tesla in browser, so you can extract the text embedded in an image if you do that. And we also 
put that together in the same post application. The way in which we approach the work uh, was in parallel to different tracks. On one side, Scott was trying to analyze the data that was in the top of and then on the other side, was trying to analyze the raw text itself. Uh, with the constraints in time that we have, we thought that was the best approach to really get something to show. In this presentation, we are showing the positive results, but there are also things that didn't quite work. Um, this presentation will be complete without reporting the negative results. I compared the, the raw tags using most frequent words uh, with a catalog of 1,500 and um, three uh, most frequent words. I also analyzed uh, using hashing techniques and PFIDF, which is supposed to give the relevance within the text and the corpus. I use with the stop words and uh, without removing the stop words. Uh, I scale, normalize, and standardize all the visual vectors. I also use different clustering techniques, blend around, which is the the tree that you can see there with linkage. Uh, I also use a relative class bin to, to get an idea how many classes are in the data, and then different kind of dimensionality reduction, which is between TCA and TCA. In the picture there, you can see that by then some classes are starting to match. So we compare these results with the results that Scott was getting with Tabimara. We basically stop working on the raw text and then just working on the top parts. So th this is just a way to say that uh, when we're doing this exploratory kind of work, there are some routes that are going to get you not. So at some point you need to stop that and stop it and keep working. We're super short on time, right? <laughs> <laughs> so just a few quick things just from a literary studies point of view. Um, I'm not going to click out to the topic models, but um, something like Guy Boothby's Dr. Nicola, which is a popular crime series in the late 19th century, a lot of the stories set in China, um, in spite of hobbies and, and Scott's efforts to serve out geography, those final topic models were still showing us all the stuff about China, so they were accurate in that sense. But we were also getting a bunch of topics that were kind of vague related to time, so topics with like days, minutes, hours, weeks, that kind of thing. Um, or something like Grant Allen's The Woman Who Did, which is one of the new women novels of the 1890s, kind of strong independent female characters. Um, the topic model did show kind of a, a topic having to do with like marriage and women, and so you know, accurate to a degree. Um, but again, you saw the same kinds of topics related to time, which I thought were kind of interesting. So I think one thing, and you know, the same topic would show up in The Woman Who Did as did um, show up in Dr. Nicolas. So you were seeing the extent to which kind of time subtends both of these stories, right? These are novels that frequently mobilize words about time in order to mark the passage of time in the story and the newness across genres. So I thought that was actually kind of an interesting takeaway from a literary studies point of view. Um, these topic models are not really showing what the story is about, but kind of the how of the narrative, how it generates itself and marks time, and kind of getting at what a narrative theorist would get at more than the subject. So I'm going to let Mark Hades speak briefly about my data. <coughs> so I'm just going to offer some brief speculations as to how this might impact the internet discovery and library context. So we went into this experiment with the idea that we would try to generate terms that could be added to the description of the data for these objects. And we didn't quite get to that point. Um, but this sort of did yield some ideas about how this kind of modeling might support discovery by surfacing other kinds of connections. So I'm going to give a rough sketch of three ideas that came out of this experiment for how this kind of modeling might manifest in a future library discovery environment. Uh, one, through a topic cluster that a library has labeled. Two, through the overlap of topic clusters. And three, based on a set of text selected by the user. All these are caveats, not today. <laughs> <laughs> so scenario number one, um, taking the kind of analysis that we did with this particular corpus, applying labels to the clusters, and displaying them to the user. So this is the closest to traditional metadata the original concept we had. Um, but the label applies to the cluster, not the work itself. So the idea is that the user clicked on one of these links, they wouldn't get a flat list of similar items, but rather a graph showing the degree and kind of similarity between texts, or how a cluster associated with this text might overlap with other clusters. Scenario number two, the user selects a particular record. Magic happens behind the scenes to suggest similar works based on how they look on the clusters overlap. 
in a way, this is a little bit similar to Calder Browse, um, but on multiple axes, so than a single linear shelf um, And by taking into account other kinds of similarity than what is usually captured in library subject analysis about the specification. Scenario number three, the user creates their own starter corpus and gets suggestions of other texts similar to what they're working with. So if you have some books that exemplify a genre or a more topic that you're interested in, a way to explore and find out what else might be out there that I'm not aware of or that hasn't been studied in this context yet. So one takeaway from this experiment um, is that, and this is probably the only time I will ever say this, it's mm -hmm. not all about the metadata. <laughs> 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 so we have also the opportunity to think about new and different approaches to discovery that aren't metadata based and how those might translate to real value. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here. I'm Sally Butch, I'm a digital archivist and subject collections. I'm Tara Shah, I'm a developer at QLFS. I'm Josh Schneider, assistant university archivist and a product and service manager in QLSS. So we'll be speaking a little bit this morning about our project to explore automating audio transcription. So we began working together in October of 2018. Um, this project was a cross-institutional effort between Special Collections, University Archives, and DLSS. And we are two archivists and one developer. And I think you'll see as we get further why having that range of skills has been really important in this project. So we were... Oh. No? No. Oh. It's going to split. So. Okay. Um, okay, so we were experimenting with the Google Cloud Speech Test tool, which is a tool that performs automatic speech recognition of either real-time audio or pre-recorded <coughs> audio files. Um, and it's able to <clears throat> recognize 120 languages. It can filter out background noise from the transcription. And it has some additional features, including the ability to add punctuation to your transcripts. Um, you can create phrases for tricky phrases. And you can also um, use speaker diarization, which identifies the speakers in the transcript. So it's very useful for um, interviews or other audio recordings with multiple speakers. So we had some broad goals, we had some more narrow goals. So one of our more acute goals <clears throat> came to us from a graduate student who was doing a project to identify the origins of certain phrases in Alan Ginsberg's um, work. So she was listening to recordings in his collection um, and having a hard time finding these specific phrases or words and thought that having transcriptions would be really helpful. So in that case, we had a very specific problem and we were looking for a solution to it. But we also had some more broad goals just to assess the viability of this tool for the thousands and thousands of audio recordings that are in Stanford Library's collections. We had some even more overarching uh, goals. So first and foremost, to try to find a way to automate the very time and labor intensive work of audio transcription. Um, we wanted to determine the viability of this specific tool um, for use by cultural heritage institutions. We wanted to explore the possible uses for the transcriptions that we were creating. And then, sort of on a personal level, we wanted to learn some skills and learn about the technology um, related to AI tools. So I'll turn it over to Sarah, who will give some more background on the like, technical aspects of the project. Thank you. Um, so here at the bottom, you can see this diagram, which is essentially like the architecture of how we did our, our script and use this API. So you see there's a FLAC file, which is an audio file. We get that from the Google Cloud storage bucket above there. We run it through our Ruby script, 
uh, call our Google, call the speech to text API to Google, and we'll write it to uh, transfer data to the text file. Um, so, some goals we accomplished and goals we wanted to accomplish was accessing files from the Google Cloud Bucket, being able to run this API over multiple uh, files, asynchronous processing for the large audio files, and saving the transcripts to the text file. Uh, this is the script that we wrote. Um, it will be on GitHub, and there'll be a link at the end of the presentation. So some problems we faced, I'll, I'll go through a couple of problems that we faced during development. Um, so for example, here you can see this error, which is a GAX error exception. And what it's saying is the payload size exceeds the limit of 10 million bytes, which is about 10 megabytes. And so it's not that, that's not that big. And so when we're running the API on local files, we're getting this error. And so what we had to do is we had to set up the correct Google IM authentication to access these buckets, to upload the audio files to the bucket, and then and then be able to read the file from the bucket and then do asynchronous processing on these files to then get around this problem. Um, another problem we faced was the audio format com compatibility. All of the files, audio files we were given were .wav, and through a lot of debugging and just reading of documentation, we found out that uh, the, the speech-to-text API only works with single-channel uh, mono audio and not .wav, which is uh, two-channel stereo audio, and so with the help of uh, Jeff Willard from Sample, we used the XL. We found out about this program called XLT, where we were able to batch convert uh, WAV files to .flat files. And so once we did that, we were able to then run the speech text API over these files. Um, so those were a couple of problems. We obviously ran into a lot more problems, um, and. The speech to text API is in beta mode, and so the documentation is always changing. And so, even from when we started in October until now, we were able to find changes in the documentation. And it was it was pretty difficult to find forums with answers to our problems, and so it required a lot of you know this reading of documentation and uh, trial and error. Um, and with that, I'll pass it on to Josh for talking about feature plans. So this is the uh, interactive, very brief interactive portion of our presentation. Um, you can see here a, a transcript that was generated um, by the script. <laughs> I'm going to play you the audio file, and you can follow along uh, with that transcript. Okay. <laughs> Um, 
relying on time offset or time codes to aid in review or potentially syncing up these transcripts with the media that we provide access to through our current systems, and then exploring more of the enhanced models that Google will offer. Most of what those currently entail are like a telephone call where you have two split channels and you know exactly how it works. Um, it'd be really interesting in the future to think about how we might develop more enhanced models that align with the cultural heritage space, like um, an interview from the 1960s in this context or something like that, and, and how that might be developed. Um, if we were to apply this script at scale, we might make it a more performance um, or developing a web UI. Um, considering broader implementation at Seoul, of course, there would be staffing concerns if this is a new workflow. Um, how might that affect uh, current staffing? Um, and also trying to better understand, currently, for most of the transcription we do, at least in the university archives, we rely on, we have one minute left. Um, okay. um, we rely on humans to do these transcriptions. So it would be really great to have a better sense of how these algorithms uh, would compare to the human transcription, and what level of work is associated with correcting an AI transcription versus just having volunteer or, or somebody we're paying do that work themselves, uh, so comparing that quality. Um, and finally, um, uh, we were all really impressed with the last presentation and some of their thoughts around how this could affect uh, current discovery. Um, so having a better sense of what might be good enough and how we might provide access um, to our content. Um, I mentioned um, comparing transcripts against some of the human-generated audio to uh, track QC. Uh, we might also use some of the same text analysis tools like um, natural language processing, identity recognition, or topic modeling to help screen for sensitive content or to identify concepts or entities to improve discovery for our users. Um, one last point we want to make is that we're talking about one script on a sorry, very narrow track of um, all the uh, content and concerns we might have that AI could help with. Um, Indiana, UT Austin, and AV Preserve um, have been working for several years and recently received funds from Mellon um, to look at metadata across audiovisual materials more broadly. So there's clearly interest in other institutions and funding agencies. And folks have gone a lot further than we have, uh, but we think that our experiment here and the work that we've done has shown um, and proven some of the value and potential value of this work to culture. Um, so, uh, as Sara and Sally mentioned, the script is now available on GitHub. If you'd like to learn more about the Ginsburg Project or Project South, um, very quickly jot down these URLs. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure that other presentations will be available later. Thank you very much. Who's in the back? We'll be able to hear him. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, so hi, I'm uh, Jesse Jack, and I'm Kurt here. And Jack Reed is apparently looming remotely on Zoom. Uh, we may or may not hear from him during the presentation. Uh, so our um, uh, topic that we're going to talk about today um, and our project for the Sewell AI Studio um, was titled, You're Lowering the Bar to Making Cloud Vision Data Usable by Leveraging IIIF. Um, so uh, what we mean by that is a lot of the topics uh, or a lot of the uh, presentations you'll see today are talking about um, what we're doing with specific content and how we're um, dealing with collections and um, uh, really great stuff. One of the things that we started thinking about this about is how um, we might be able to uh, leverage the, the IIIF. We'll talk a little bit more about what IIIF is for those who aren't familiar. Um, how we can leverage that uh, in a way that would allow us, uh, not only us here at Stanford, but others in the um, IIIF uh, community to be able to use cloud services uh, to take advantage of that data and then pull that back using IIIF into um, various uh, uh, discovery environments. <coughs> and I'll let Chris talk more about what the point is. Great. So IIIF, if you don't know, um, what it says is an API in the community um, where uh, you've got a baseline functionality for viewing, zooming in, and assembly resources in order to view, compare, and manipulate images on the web. Um, and it's used by many cultural 
Library and organizations worldwide. Um, Stanford Libraries was a founding member of this community, um, and we have support for these Scripplyet APIs within a variety of applications that developed here, um, including uh, Perl, which uh, works uh, at Stanford. Um, so if you've ever seen a digital item in works um, that's powered by these APIs. So there are two core components to digital items. The first is an image API um, that allows a machine or a browser uh, to request um, a particular region or size or quality of an image resource. Um, the second key part is a presentation API that um, is machine readable and tells you how to stitch them together or sequence them or assemble groups of these images. Um, and what that allows us to do um, is to support the web annotation data model which allows you to then annotate this content. And so you can point out particular regions in the image that might contain the face of a particular person or text on a page uh, or what have you. Um, and that can either be generated by users um, or, as, as we're saying here, can be generated by AI based tools. Um, so once you have all this information gathered, um, there are existing viewers, including Universal Viewer and Mirador, um, which again are both implemented here in, in Capsule. Um, you get support for viewing these resources, so it's really easy to then uh, untangle the massive blob of pretty opaque, um, machine readable uh, data you get back from AI tooling. So, um... The culmination of what uh, the progress that we have made uh, up until this point, or until we kind of um, uh, the last time that we've been working on this, is pretty much uh, what I've laid out here. So we use the presentation API that Chris just mentioned um, to retrieve uh, for a given object in the digital repository a list of image references uh, if that particular object had any. Um, we again using IIIF construct uh, image URLs. <coughs> using that API, uh, and then we can then pass those URLs to uh, Google's cloud vision or computer vision APIs. There's lots of different options, which I'll kind of, we'll talk a little bit more about what um, <coughs> can give us back. Um, but the, basically, some of what we'll show is kind of the, 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 the totality of those options that they have so far. Um, then what we've done with that data is we'll store the results uh, of the, all of the analysis that Google has done on that, or we'll store that uh, into a, uh, what's called a Firestore database. It's basically just uh, Google's version of a, a, a data store uh, in the cloud. Um, kind of where we want to go with this in the future uh, is now that we've got that information stored in the database, we can process that content into IIIF compatible W3C annotations. Uh, as Chris mentioned, uh, what IIIF is always dealing with is basically annotations all the way down, is kind of the joke that we uh, say regularly. Uh, ultimately, if we can take information that the, uh, the AI tooling is giving us, like regions of interest, faces, um, we can actually start automatically annotating those and uh, return those in a IIIF compatible way, which means the viewers that implement those will already be able to take advantage and render those without any additional work on our side. Um, and yeah, as I said, as listed here, we can uh, produce you know, additional data augmented with that, either new manifests or new uh, different annotation lists that can be picked up and used by uh, various services. Um, just to kind of show what is possible, um, some of the analysis that we did do, uh, we took uh, this particular image uh, out of one of the collections in our repository. Um, there's a whole list of things on the left here, which I won't go into uh, extremely in depth in time, but I'll kind of call out some of the interesting things that we think that the uh, Cloud Vision the APIs can return to us. Um, so uh, one of the things is you can pull full text annotations out. Um, this can be interesting for pulling out uh, text within images. Um, they also have other tools that might be more geared towards optical character recognition of actually doing like full text documents. Um, but we found this one was going to be particularly interesting for pulling uh, text out of otherwise non-textual images. Um, one of the things you will notice here is it's not perfect. Uh, that clearly says Poplar Street, um, but the API did not return the correct thing. Um, so that's obviously uh, something to consider. Um, if we can pull the colors out. So uh, one of the things this gives, I'm showing briefly, 
uh, the most dominant color uh, in this, and for all of you, um, maybe uh, uh, CSS-minded folks, uh, 86, 86, 86 is, as you might have guessed, a gray. Um, and gray is the dominant color in this photo. It actually didn't take computer to figure that out. <laughs> uh, the, uh, you can also pull out label annotations. So this could be interesting things to this potentially facilitate discovery, uh, particularly for images that might not have uh, this analysis on it. Um, so one of the things said this was a crowd. Um, other things that said black and white photography. Um, uh, another interesting thing it said was recreation. So again, there's a confidence that sometimes the it can be a little bit hit or miss on the results. Um, they have a safe search uh, annotation, which again could be you know, potentially useful, particularly if we're trying to mass accession some content and need to get a good idea about whether the images that we have are on the web. Um, and again, in the interest of time, uh, just again, interesting things that they, they are pulling out from the web. So they have a best guess label. Um, what, what for this image was uh, Martin Luther King Jr. and Joe and Baez, which is almost identical to the title that we have in search books. So I found that particularly interesting. Um, the different entities uh, that they had come across in here, and the last one, which is this. Uh, Pages with matching images, which is really interesting because there's lots of uh, images around there. This one happened to be an uh, image on eclectic fashion um, that, in fact, did have this image in it. Um, <laughs> you can get similar images, uh, which, again, uh, there's lots, lots of uses you can imagine for this, which I won't go too deep into because they're way over time. Um, but you can see they are uh, similar images. They have similar people in them and they're of similar events. Um, I don't know if Jack can speak. Um, yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, and so kind of, you know, as we're looking forward, this is, you know, our kind of idea here was to build, start to build the infrastructure and pipelines to uh, move this content and start to do it in a scalable way. And so what, what we've tried to, I guess, start with here is uh, the beginnings of the pipeline to enable uh, at Stanford libraries, you know, access to millions of Stanford images to be piped into the Google Cloud platform. And in what we're in, in kind of in the examples that Jesse and Chris talked about, we see opportunities for integration with our additional services. So uh, potentially features like, like like things that the other groups have talked about, uh, like a feature that now could be used with this data in SearchWorks, or um, to aid um, uh, metadata analysis tasks um, or aggregation for kind of analysis over our holdings. Uh, you know, and kind of with the Tumblr example, um, Jesse mentioned, it'd be interested to think about donor relations or content acquisition. Where is our content being uh, hosted elsewhere on the internet and how can we uh, utilize that for uh, social media discovery or, um, you know, we, we, can, we can actually, uh, you know, give information back to donors or our collectors uh, about where their curators, where their uh, content is on the internet. So. Thanks, Jack. So today we'd like to talk to you about image recognition and archaeological research. Our um, general aim is to apply machine learning techniques to enhance your metadata for Chattel Research Project's image repository. Chattel was originally excavated in the 1960s. It is a 9,000-year-old settlement currently lo located in modern-day Turkey, and it's recognized as one of the most important archaeological sites in the world. In 1993, uh, an international team of archaeologists and researchers began excavating there under the direction of Ian Hodder, based at Stanford. And since the outset, um, this project has sort of stood out as an early adopter of um, innovative approach approaches in uh, information technology and digital reporting solutions. So today, after 25 years of research, we've accumulated close to five terabytes of data, and this includes about 150,000 images. 
These images are used to identify artifacts, they document excavated objects in their original context, and they record the excavation process. Of these images, about 49,000 of them lack um, valuable metadata. And this inconsistency of metadata makes extracting relevant information for research purposes from these images really challenging. So while the site of Charolut and the project are exceptional in so many ways, this problem is not exceptional. It exists for um, most archaeological projects and sites. And that's because archaeology is a destructive science. When we dig, we destroy the contexts that are essential to our research and interpretation. So one of our main um, objectives in doing field work is to accurately um, and de uh, accurately record our excavation process in a detailed manner. And this makes photographs um, sort of a vital visual record of our process. Where machine learning has been applied in archaeology, it's typically focused on symbol object, single objects and patterns to support researchers in their classification and assessment, so classifying stone tools or pottery and things like that. Here, we'd like to go beyond just identifying archaeological objects, but also focus on the context that these objects are found in, so the relationship between the different artifacts. And this is especially exciting because beyond basic identification, this type of textual information isn't really contained in the metadata. And so with machine learning, we have this opportunity um, to explore untapped analytical potential for archaeological photographs. So our current experiments are mostly aimed at labeling the 49,000 images that lack metadata. And we do this using a subset of labeled images in the database, a subset of images labeled manually, and a subset taken with whiteboards that contain information about what's being photographed. But ultimately, we'd like to be able to query images for contextual information, like finding walls with paintings, or a bone and stone artifacts together, and things like that. And that would be um, sort of the really exciting part of this. And with all of that said, I'll hand things over to Claudia, and she can talk a little bit about our experiments and what we've done so far. Okay, uh, let me preface this with saying that this is embarrassingly, embarrassingly hot fake, but we hope this is it. So, <laughs> <laughs> this is an example of the actual tags that we have in our metadata. We have a three fields feature type keyboard file description, and I've sorted them by um, how many labels are given. And so you can see that the NAs and the question marks are at the top really. 90% or 40% of keywords or over 40% of file descriptions are non-existent. That brings us to a total of the 49,000 images that have no information whatsoever. Um, looking at the actual keywords, uh, we, the actual labels, um, they're also kind of messy. So we have uh, things that's actually here, fire installation. So these are two words that have some uh, different meaning than if we have fines, comma, figurine. Or we have people, and that's something describing the people, people uh, working. Um, so the labels in the, uh, that we have are messy as well. Now, um, given the overall problem that uh, we want to get a better understanding of what is in these images, um, we've dabbled into different approaches. Um, one is uh, referring to these embedded uh, whiteboards uh, that are in these images and that contain some metadata. So last summer, we had the opportunity to work with a computer scientist PhD student who helped us out uh, kindly, and, and developed um, uh, we developed our own a model chain, our own model to detect uh, those whiteboards, um, and we discovered about 22,000 of these images that have this kind of information. Um, so the next step, we are working on training some things to really actually extract the text. The text. Um, Another thing um, we uh, I spent some time actually more recently is using exactly the same API that uh, Jesse was talking about, and uh, the Google uh, Cloud uh, Vision API, um, and it, that, that one, and then we used another API called Clarify API. So we ran uh, about exactly ran 766 images through both of these predictors. And what we get back is here's our image, and then we get back a whole bunch of labels. These are the Google labels, these are the Clarify labels, and then we get the scores, which kind of indicates how confident these predictors are about uh, this particular label. Um, so having Google Vision API, Google Cloud Vision API, uh, label our images, and having Clarify label our images, uh, we kind of uh, were interested in seeing, well, how do they interact? I mean, 
how do they um, agree on? So the idea is if I give the same answer to clarify and to Google, what will those tell me and how will it be, will it be um, the same? Um, so you can see to some extent we are the same. Um, I looked specifically about um, and the question of how many of the total of images made. So we have quite a number, 605 out of 76, 766 images. Both have some agreement. Um, they agree at least on one label here, about 200, over 100, slightly less than 180. They agree on two labels, and of course it goes down. There are a few. They actually agree on nine labels. Um, I was looking at the scores as well, the confidence about these labels. These are labels um, uh, that are used more than 20 times, more than 20 uh, different images. So we can see that Clarify is generally more confident than Google. And uh, we can see that Google wiggles more up and down. Uh, so Clarify has more constant values here. Um, and what's perhaps interesting is that there are some, like Soil, or there's another wall, I think. Um, what is uh, they agree quite a bit on, so well here, wall, these two. And then uh, landscape, they have quite a disagreement, and concrete, there's yeah, more of a disagreement. Um, so that's fine and good, um, but uh, what we uh, really want to know is the usefulness of these labels. And so what I went back to is actually do the labels that we are given. So this shows. Um, all the images that we already had labeled with wall, and I'm looking at Google Vision and API here, and Clarify Prediction API here, and out of all these wall images, about 60% Clarify correctly identified as wall, and 20% Google Vision identified as wall. Versus those that we're not labeled, we have, don't have labeled as wall, uh, doesn't mean there is no wall in there, because a lot of people are missing uh, numbers, uh, but certainly this is lower. So maybe, maybe it is picking up something. If you look at the scores, though, um, you can see a tiny difference. I mean, the, the wall images are slightly more confident, but I would not consider this in any way statistically significant. So, um, um, uh, maybe this is, you know, question mark. Uh, okay, so um, is this useful? Um, my sense from now, uh, what we have done, is that uh, probably it might be useful to help us classify images in these broader categories, like the people on there, or there's just the excavation site, or there are these discrete objects um, uh, that are photographed in the lab. Uh, but you can't really impress an archaeologist if you tell her. This is an image that shows soil. So what we're working towards now is uh, to train our work our way towards uh, training our own models, um, potentially um, perhaps using some of these uh, existing frameworks like uh, Google LML or something like that. Um, and bringing together our own labels, perhaps training data, um, and then some of the existing images. Um, this is the website. We've done much more of uh, 3,766 images if you're interested. Um, and that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Um, and one idea that emerged from the meeting was a potential uh, collaboration on similar image search platform. And Nicole asked me to talk today about some ideas we discussed for how similar image search could be used to assist with metadata creation. So what is similar image search? It's a search that's based on an image that is uploaded to or selected from a search interface, and it uses machine learning algorithms to find similar images. Of course, there isn't a universal definition of familiarity, and images seen similar can vary regardless of whether they're determined by a human or computer. For instance, images could be considered similar because they contain the same content, the same color, or composition. So here you can see some images um, that were just similar images that were detected using the machine learning software library TensorFlow on some New York Public Library Farm Security Administration photographs. So some look so similar um, on the bottom that they appear to be duplicates. Others um, have contain a similar structure or have a similar composition. And then also on the bottom, they have the same people in them. So as you've seen content-based analysis using computer vision is becoming an exciting area of research. And previously, content-based searches relied on textual searching, which in turn relies on labeled data. As I imagine, as many of us know from our work here, we collect materials that have a minimal amount of metadata, which can make creating that metadata to ensure those materials are discoverable in our search environment, particularly a resource-intensive endeavor. So visual search would mean that textual data does not necessarily have to be available. So a similar search interface might look something like this. Uh, the computer vision group of Heidelberg University developed an interface to explore our collections based on visual searches. The algorithm uses a classifier based on contours in the images and is trained using negative examples. So it can detect identical and similar image regions within images as well as entire images. Users can select up to five bounding boxes or the whole image to perform a query to find similar objects or entire scene, so you can see the bounding boxes in the green on the right. When the search is completed, the bills appear in a separate window and they're ordered according to their degree of similarity. The user can evaluate the results and then repeat the search process to refine the search and retrain the model. So if we had some sort of similar image search interface here at Stanford, uh, what might the possible applications be for metadata creation? So I'm going to talk about uh, a couple of possibilities based on some examples from my work with digital image collections. So one major application could be for identifying entities in image collections. The Metadata Development Unit has done a significant amount of work with name authority creation in the Library of Congress name authority file for people depicted in the Stanford Historical Photographs collection. While well, the historical photograph collection does have metadata associated with the photographs, uh, that metadata can be a very incomplete list. Names are often scribbled on the back of the photograph, so they might be misspelled or legible. Um, a name might only consist of a surname, or a woman might only be identified by her married surname. So the name authority file uh, still relies on text strings to differentiate names. So before an authority record can be created, some names require quite a bit of time-consuming detective work to make them unique. In this example, metadata in the collection identified the woman on the right in the photograph as Mrs. W.H. Myrick. Additional searching eventually led me to another image of her in the Palo Alto Historical Association collection that gave me her first name, Julia. Similar image search across a platform of images shared between institutions might have made identification of Julia much easier. Being able to search for other images containing a person within Stanford collections or in other institutions' collections could help us identify people even without a name or find additional contextual information that might make the identification process quicker. In a manner similar to how our MARC records are periodically checked to see if any of our records have been enhanced by other institutions, similar image searches on a shared platform could be conducted regularly to see if new entities have been identified and additional metadata can be added to our collections. <coughs> Being able to conduct a similar image search within an image collection could also be helpful. 
For instance, I had done some work on subjects for a collection of images of a symposium in honor of Stephen Chu, the Nobel Prize physicist, that are part of the Stephen Chu papers. There was minimal metadata for the subjects in this collection, and I ended up deciding the Library of Congress subject heading Stephen Chu, Friends and Associates, so many of the images. <laughs> this collection seemed like a prime target for machine learning. Many participate many participants were name tags with their name and institution. So using Google Class Vision text analysis, we might be able to leverage uh, the text with any images and identify people from their name tags. However, some people's name tags won't necessarily be visible. So in that case, a similar image search could look for additional images in the collection to see if the person in question appeared elsewhere where the name tag is more visible. Even though this is a small collection, this work of work would have been much too time consuming and complicated for me to complete on my own. But an effective similar image search could significantly improve the discoverability of the collection. An additional application for similar image search is finding duplicate images. Um, I've been working on metadata for the Robbie Byers photographs of the Sanford Bain collection for a really long time, and 150,000 images were born digital. And it turned out there were a couple thousand duplicates in the collection. So I had to figure out which images were duplicated, and I've since been working to ensure that those duplicate images have the same metadata. As you can see, in this case, I found a triplicate, and each source ID, which is partially composed of the file name that we used for the photo, provides additional information about the photograph that's not present in the others. This process has been quite labor intensive. And it's involved a significant amount of data manipulation. Similar image search, as well as a way of performing metadata analysis to find differences in metadata between images, would make discovering duplicate images and sharing metadata between them much easier. Duplicate image detection can also be useful for providing duplicates in other institutions' collections <laughs> and establishing connections between collections that were previously unknown. So these are just a few ideas. Uh, for how similar image search could significantly help with metadata creation for image collections. As these examples demonstrate, the ability to find similar images across Stanford collections and across other institution collections, possibly using some sort of shared supply app based image platform, could help us find unexpected ways to enhance metadata in our collections and generate connections to images in the collections we weren't aware of. Similar image search also provides a way to bypass the inconsistent metadata we find within our own collections and across institutions, and I think it would be an exciting avenue to per pursue for future experimentation. All right, well, thank you all for, for staying. Um, obviously, we've done a little more overtime than we had hoped. Um, but if you have questions or any of the um, presenters, this is your opportunity. And let me know if you have any questions. Everything is covered. <laughs> well, I know many of you in this room also know the presenters, know that they're available. Um, if you don't, the presentations and everything will also be online and contact people afterwards. Thank you so much again. Yeah. Oh, it's. 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 Oh,